As pretty much everyone expected, the Bank of Canada held its rate at 5% this morning. I'm going to cover all of their reasoning in this video today. The latest Equifax report on consumer debt is concerning. There's a rise in websites impersonating real companies, and these scams are working. And we're going to cover two of Apple's legal-related stories, including a massive fine in the European Union. Today is Wednesday, March 6, 2024. Now, before I go into today's top stories, I just want to let you know I will be out of town next week, so I won't be here with my usual market updates on Mondays and Wednesdays. But don't be surprised if I do make an appearance or two with other non-news related videos. If you are new to the channel, it'd be very nice if you would subscribe. Now, let's get started with today's news. As pretty much everyone expected, the Bank of Canada this morning held its target rate at a 5%. And in its statement, the bank made a number of comments. And I'm going to go through those here and give you some of the, uh, the logic behind the decisions that they make there. From a GDP perspective, the bank noted that global economic growth slowed in the fourth quarter. And then when they focused here on Canada, the economy did grow in the fourth quarter by more than expected, although the pace did still remain weak and below potential. Real GDP expanded by 1% after it had contracted by half a percent in the third quarter. Consumption here was up a modest 1% and final domestic demand contracted with a large decline in business investment. Canada also saw a strong increase in exports, which helped boost the growth. When they looked south of the border, because that does affect us here obviously in Canada as well, uh, US GDP also uh, slowed, but it did remain surprisingly robust and broad-based. Uh, so it's solid contributions from consumption and exports. Now over in the Euro area, economic growth was flat at the end of the year um, after it had contracted in the third quarter. Uh, employment continues to grow, grow more slowly than our population. There are now signs that wage pressures may be easing a little bit. Um, overall, uh, the data point to the economy in modest excess supply. Now, on the inflation front, the January Canadian CPI increased to 2.9% um, as goods price inflation moderated a little bit further. Uh, shelter price remains elevated and is the biggest contributor to inflation. Um, of note, underlying inflationary pressures do persist. Year over year and three month measures of core inflation are in the three to three and a half percent range. And the share of CPI components that is above 3% uh, decline, but is still above our historic averages. Inflation in the U.S. and in the euro areas continued to ease. Uh, the bank continues to expect inflation to remain close to 3% during the first half of this year before gradually easing later in the year. So after factoring all this in, the bank decided to hold the policy rate at 5% and to continue to normalize, uh, normalize the bank's uh, balance sheet. The council is still concerned about risks to the outlook for inflation, particularly the persistence in underlying inflation. Uh, they do want to see uh, further and sustained easing in core inflation, and they continue to focus on the balance between supply and demand in the economy, inflation expectations, wage growth, and corporate pricing behavior. According to Equifax Canada, we saw a concerning trend in the fourth quarter of 2023, especially in the provinces of Ontario and British Columbia. They cite mortgage holders and credit card users um, who are increasingly missing their payments. And they're saying that this is a reflection of the higher impact of interest rates and of inflation. Rebecca Oakes, she's the Vice President of Advanced Analytics at Equifax Canada. She says that the strain is particularly visible during mortgage renewals and especially in the regions with expensive housing markets. Mortgage delinquency rates in Ontario were up by 135% compared with the, the previous year. In BC, uh, the rate rose by 62%. And in both of these cases, we've now surpassed the pre-pandemic levels. This financial stress also extends to credit card payments, especially amongst homeowners aged 36 and below. So these, this group also um, often has higher mortgage payments uh, and fewer savings. Now, outside of British Columbia and Ontario, uh, their mortgage payments are, were lower. Delinquency rates are rising, but at a pace that's slower than Ontario and BC, and they're still remaining below those pre-pandemic levels. So what we're seeing here is that as uh, interest rates rise, homeowners who locked in these historically low rates back in the 2020 uh, range, uh, they may struggle with increased monthly mortgage payments in the fourth quarter alone, they noted that the average mortgage payments rose by $457 and by more than $680 in BC and Ontario. Um, also, the report shows that total consumer debt reached $2.45 trillion in the fourth quarter, um, with non-mortgage debt increasing by 4.1%, mainly driven by rising credit card debt. 
Additionally, the number of consumers who are missing payments on credit uh, products has surpassed 2019 levels. This also raises concerns about consumer insolvencies. While we are still below pre-pandemic levels, this sharp increase in mortgage holders filing for bankruptcy, particularly in Ontario and BC, uh, is quite alarming. The way I see this, this escalating trend of missed payments on mortgages and credit cards, particularly in Ontario and British Columbia, this just underscored, underscores the financial strain that so many Canadians all across the country um, are facing. As interest rates continue to, to climb, uh, it's going to be crucial now for homeowners to carefully assess their financial situations and prepare for potential monthly increases uh, in payments to avoid falling behind and into financial distress. Scamming Canadian consumers and businesses through fake websites that mimic legitimate companies is really a growing concern here in Canada. These fraudulent sites are tricking unsuspecting users into making purchases or providing personal information, which then of course leads to financial losses. A recent example of this occurrence is Riza Bacchus, who fell victim to the scheme while trying to buy a Stetson hat from a seemingly authentic Canadian website. Despite spending about $100 US, he never did receive the product and later discovered that it was a scam. Now, what's most alarming about these fake sites is how quickly they're growing with fraudulent appear, uh, listings are appearing in search engine results, which will then direct users to the fake websites. Flight Center, a travel agent chain, also has faced similar uh, situations here with fake phone numbers which lead customers then to unknown call centers instead of the legitimate branches. We're seeing an uprise in that. Now, one British Columbia resident lost over $2,000 after calling what he thought was a legitimate flight center uh, number. It turned out to be fraudulent and he booked a flight there. Even though um, efforts are being made of course, to take down these fraudulent listings, they often reappear, uh, reappear just as quickly um, as they're taken down. And this poses a challenge for companies like Flight Center and others. They're requiring significant resources for monitoring uh, to address this problem. Uh, cyber security experts, they emphasize the importance of awareness in combating these scams. Now, consumers and businesses, as always, are encouraged to report fraudulent websites and listings to uh, search engines um, or payment processing companies, as well as utilizing um, government resources such as the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre and Get Cyber Safe website. I know this has been said a million times, but it's worth repeating here. The rise of these fake websites targeting Canadian consumers uh, and, and businesses as well as consumers, it's just another example of the need to always be vigilant and proactive uh, and we, as we take measures to protect against these online scams. It is crucial for both businesses and individuals to stay informed, report suspicious activity promptly, and to utilize whatever available resources they have to safeguard against fraud. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Harvest ETFs, who just reached $4 billion in AUM, and where they believe in building and preserving wealth through long-term ownership of high-quality businesses. Whether you are in the market for equities or fixed income, they do have the right blend of products to help you reach your financial goals. At Harvest ETFs, their core offerings revolve around covered call strategies and helping generate income for their unit holders. Uh, to highlight ticker HHL, this is the Harvest Healthcare Leaders Income ETF with over $1.4 billion in AUM, providing investors with an 8% plus yield and exposure to 20 large capitalization global healthcare stocks. This one is a favorite amongst Canadian investors. And this, of course, is just one of their many offerings. If you are into fixed income, their ETF HPYT focuses on U.S. Treasury ETFs with a covered call option strategy. They have all-in-one solutions like HDIF, the Harvest Diversified Monthly Income Fund, making portfolio allocation a breeze. The list goes on and on. But regardless of the fund, the goal with Harvest is ultimately to deliver reliable high monthly distributions to their investors. Harvest ETFs is a game changer for income investors with their consistent returns or strategic approach may just align perfectly with your financial goals. Visit HarvestETFs.com or click on the link in the description to learn more about Harvest ETFs. Before I get back to my news stories, congratulations to Max Nicholson and the team over at Blossom Social. As of this past weekend, the platform crossed over the 100,000 member level. And that's from starting at 5,000 uh, about a year ago or so. And that is phenomenal growth. It's a testament to the great work that this team is putting in there. If you are a DIY investor, you're looking for a sounding board as you try to make your buy and sell decisions, or even if you're just trying to figure out what your game plan should be, check Blossom out. Uh, while you're there, uh, check out my profile. My username is Mark B. 
so it's M-A-R-C-B. You can take a peek at the stocks I own, the trades I make, and some of the reasoning behind what I do, what I do. So congratulations again to Max and the team. Looking forward to seeing what the rest of 2024 brings. I have a couple of Apple related stories to go over today. And first off, the European Union has issued its first antitrust penalty against Apple, and it has fined the company nearly $2 billion for unfairly favoring its own music service over its competitors. And this action comes as a result of Apple's practice of restricting developers from informing users about cheaper subscription options uh, outside of its iOS apps. Now, Apple has responded by challenging the decision. They said that they will, or uh, they do intend to appeal the fine. The company also disputes the commission's findings. They argue that the investigation did not demonstrate any evidence of harm to consumers and overlooks the competitive nature of the market. Apple also criticizes the decision for benefiting Spotify, which of course is a major player in the music streaming market. They suggest that the EU's actions could further entrench Spotify's dominant position. This fine is part of a uh, of broader efforts by the EU to regulate big tech, co big tech companies. We're seeing a lot of that now. Uh, they're bringing in new regulations that are set to come in soon, uh, and they're designed to prevent digital market monopolization. The investigation, which was originally prompted by a complaint from Spotify, focuses on Apple's in-house payment system, uh, the commissions that they get, and the restrictions on app developers from directing sources to alternative subscription payment methods. The penalty is significant not only for its financial impact uh, on Apple, but also for the message that it sends to the, the EU stance uh, for fair competition and market fairness. The EU aims to ensure consumers have access to a variety of options and are fully informed about their choices. And with new rules coming up on the horizon, these tech giants like Apple will be facing stricter and stricter oversight. They have to adapt their practices to comply with the regulations, uh, potentially leading to significant changes in how the digital markets operate in the first place. Now, another Apple-related news. In its legal battles, the company has agreed to a proposed settlement of up to $14.4 million uh, with eligible members of a class action lawsuit that was filed in British Columbia. The lawsuit accused Apple of deliberately slowing down older iPhone models through software updates, specifically targeting the iPhone 6 and 7 series. And Apple, while it does deny any wrongdoing, it has opted to settle this case. It says that the payment is not an admission of any guilt. So eligible claimants, uh, depending on the number of applicants here, they could receive anywhere from $17.50 uh, up to a high of uh, $150 um, after they provide the serial number of their impacted device. So this um, settlement, it covers all residents of Canada except for Quebec, where there are other similar lawsuits that have been filed. The judge overseeing this case um, he deemed the settlement to be fair, reasonable, and in the best interest of the class. Michael Peerless, who was counsel for the class, uh, highlighted Apple's willingness to support their product without legally admitting any fault. Apple customers who purchased an affected iPhone model be before December 21st, 2017 are eligible for compensation. A claims process will be out soon, and it will direct the distribution of cash payments to those who submit an approved form. The issue at the heart of this lawsuit is Apple's lack of transparency regarding software updates that slowed down devices purportedly to address battery issues with security flaws without any clear communication to the users themselves. So critics argue that this practice led customers to upgrade new model to new models uh, sooner than they would otherwise have been necessary to. I know I've probably fallen into that gap where your, your phone slows down and before you know it, you're just saying, uh, heck, I'm going to go buy a new phone. I think if I look back over my iPhone career, that's probably happened to me. Uh, public reaction to the settlement has generally been positive, uh, with individuals expressing satisfaction that, that, that uh, Apple is being held accountable, albeit in this case in quite a limited financial capacity. Um, this case does echo a similar situation in the U.S. where Apple settled for an amount between $310 and $500 million over the same issue. Before I sign off, please don't forget to subscribe to our Pulse newsletter. That goes out every weekend. If you haven't already done so, you can visit our Investing Academy website. I will put a link for both of those in the description of today's video. As I mentioned at the beginning, I will be out of town next week, so there won't be any channel update here. Uh, but don't be surprised if I make an appearance or two with a non-news related video. Again, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video.